When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Kitties, it is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, here with yet another special episode of Twisted Tea Time. Now, for some of you, this is the first episode of the new year, and it might even be coming a touch on the late side. What can I say? I'm a debaucherous spirit. And the year of 2016, which really has no impact to the flow of time beyond some artificial construct forged in the collective consciousness of humanity, needed a proper send-off. Which, in turn, means my pitiful mortal host body needed a bit of a recovery time. I swear I wear out these human bodies far too quickly. Now. Tonight's tea is a uh, cheap Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the label doesn't matter. I just picked up whatever seemed most affordable. <laughs> the holidays done cleaned me out. Before we get on to tonight's subject matter, I'd like to remind all of you out there in the audio aether that should you want to support this show, Find Twisted Tea Time on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and even Google Play, and give us a positive review. It helps more than you likely know. Another detail you may or may not notice in tonight's episode is that there will be new background music. While I am far and away from locking my own personal composer away in some sub-basement, I did get permission to use the haunting melodies of one Jason White, a musician and composer in the Pacific Northwest who specializes in ambient and gothic music, as well as film scores. For more information on where to find his music, take a look at the show notes or wait until the end of this episode. Well, kitties, we've gone from a year largely derided as terrible to one people foolishly believe will be better, despite all evidence to the contrary. As such, I think I know the perfect set of stories to kick off the first few episodes of the new year. Why, H.P. Lovecraft stories, of course! After all, what a better way to begin the new year than with some cosmic horror reminding us that, in the grand scheme of the universe, we mean not a wit, and are like unto grains of sand, if that. Can always count on Lovecraft to brighten one's day. After all, being such an unimportant speck, such a worthless waste of stardust, such a non-entity in the grand design, ought to encourage you to live life to the fullest, or some such inspirational and uplifting talk like that. At least I tried, damn it. Now, one could never call Lovecraft a cheerful and among his works were a number of more fantastical pieces, inspired at least partially by another author, one Lord Dunsany, an author of a number of fantasy stories that were rather different from those Tolkien penned. In fact, some of those tales, the darker ones, naturally, may end up on this show. With this inspiration in mind, it comes as no surprise that some of Lovecraft's works were as much fantasy as they were cosmic horror. And so, it is without further ado 
that I present unto you one such tale. H.P. Lovecraft's The Doom That Came to Sorrow. There is, in the land of Nod, a vast, still lake that is fed by no stream, and out of which no stream flows. Ten thousand years ago, there stood by its shore the mighty city of Sarnath, but Sarnath stands there no more. It is told that in the immemorial years when the world was young, before ever the men of Sarnath came to the land of Nar, another city stood beside the lake the grey stone city of Ib, which was old as the lake itself, and peopled with beans not pleasing to behold. Very odd and ugly were these beans, as indeed are most beans of a world yet inchoate and rudely fashioned. It is written on the brick cylinders of Cadatheron that the beans of Ib were in hue as green as the lake and the mists that rise above it, that they had bulging eyes pouting, flabby lips, and curious ears, and were without voice. It is also written that they descended one night from the moon in a mist, they in the vast still lake and grey stone city of Ib. However this may be, it is certain that they worshipped a sea-green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Bokrug, the great water lizard, before which they danced horribly when the moon was gibbous. And it is written in the papyrus of Ilarnak that they one day discovered fire and thereafter kindled flames on many ceremonial occasions. But not much is written of these beings, because they lived in very ancient times, and man is young, and knows but little of the very ancient living things. After many aeons, men came to the land of Nar. Dark shepherd folk with their fleecy flocks who built Thra, Ilarnak, and Kadatharon on the winding river Ai. And certain tribes, more hardy than the rest, pushed on to the border of the lake and built Sarnath at a spot where precious metals were found in the earth. Not far from the grey city of Ib did the wandering tribes lay the first stones of Sarnath, and at the beans of Ib they marveled greatly. But with their marveling was mixed hate, for they thought it not meet that beings of such aspect should walk about the world of men at dusk, nor did they like the strange sculptures upon the grey monoliths of Ib, for those sculptures were terrible with great antiquity. Why the beings and the sculptures lingered so late in the world, even until the coming of man, none can tell unless it was because the land of Nar is very still and remote from most other lands, both of waking and of dream. As the men of Sarnath beheld more of the beings of Ib, their hate grew, and it was not less because they found the beings weak and soft as jelly to the touch of stones and spears and arrows. So one day, the young warriors, the slingers and the spearmen and the bowmen, marched against Ib and slew all the inhabitants thereof, pushing their queer bodies into the lake with long spears because they did not wish to touch them. And because they did not like the grey sculptured monoliths of Ib, they cast these also into the lake, wondering from the greatness of the labor however the stones were brought from afar, as they must have been, since there is not like them in all the land of Nar, or in the lands adjacent. Thus, of the very ancient city of Ib was nothing spared save the sea-green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Bukrug, the water lizard. This the young warriors took back with them to Sarnath as a symbol of conquest over the old gods and beings of Ib, and a sign of leadership in Minar. But on the night after it was set up in the temple, a terrible thing must have happened. For weird lights were seen over the lake, and in the morning the people found the idol gone, and the high priest Taran Ish, lying dead as from some fear unspeakable. And before he died, Taran Ish had scrawled upon the altar of chrysolite, with coarse, shaky strokes, the sign, 
of doom. After Tauron Ish, there were many high priests in Sarnath, but never was the sea green stone idol found, and many centuries came and went wherein Sarnath prospered exceedingly, so that only priests and old women remembered what Tauron Ish had scrawled upon the altar of Chrysolite. Betwixt Sarnath and the city of Alarnek arose a caravan route, and the precious metals from the earth were exchanged for other metals and rare cloths and jewels and books and tools for artificers and all things of luxury that are known to the people who dwell along the winding river Eye and beyond. So Sarnath waxed mighty and learned and beautiful and sent forth conquering armies to subdue the neighboring cities. And in time there sate upon a throne in Sarnath the kings of all the land of Menar and of many lands adjacent. The wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind was Sarnath the Magnificent. Of polished desert quarried marble were its walls, in height three hundred cubits, and in breadth seventy-five, so that chariots might pass each other as men drave them along the top. For full five hundred stadia did they run, being open only on the side toward the lake where a green stone sea wall kept back the waves that rose oddly once a year at the festival of the destroying of Ib. In Sarnath were fifty streets from the lake to the gate of the caravans, and fifty more intersecting them. With onyx were they paved, save those whereon the horses and camels and elephants trod, which were paved with granite, and the gates of Sarnath were as many as the landward ends of the streets, each of bronze and flanked by the figures of lions and elephants carven from some stone no longer known among men. The houses of Sarnath were of glazed brick and chalcedony, each having its walled garden and crystal lakelet. With strange art were they builded, for no other city had houses like them, and travelers from Thra and Ilarnek and Kadatheron marveled at the shining domes wherewith they were surmounted. But more marvelous still were the palaces and the temples and the gardens made by Zokar, the olden king. There were many palaces, the least of which were mightier than any in Thra or Alarnak or Kadatheron. So high were they that one within might sometimes fancy himself beneath only the sky Yet when lighted with torches dipped in the oil of Dothur, their walls shewed vast paintings of kings and armies, of a splendor at once inspiring and stupefying to the beholder. Many were the pillars of the palaces, all of tinted marble and carven into designs of surpassing beauty, and in most of the palaces the floors were mosaics of beryl and lapis lazuli and sardonyx and carbuncle and other choice materials so disposed that the beholder might fancy himself walking over beds of the rarest flowers. And there were likewise fountains which cast scented waters about in pleasing jets arranged with cunning art. Outshining all others was the palace of the kings of Nar and of the lands adjacent. On a pair of golden crouching lions rested the throne, many steps above the gleaming floor. And it was wrought of one piece of ivory, though no man lives who knows whence so vast a piece could have come. In that palace there were also many galleries and many amphitheaters, where lions and men and elephants battled at the pleasure of the kings. Sometimes the amphitheaters were flooded with water conveyed from the lake in mighty aqueducts, and then were enacted stirring sea fights or combats betwixt swimmers and deadly marine things. Lofty and amazing were the seventeen tower-like temples of Sarnath, fashioned of a bright multi-colored stone not known elsewhere. A full thousand cubits high stood the greatest among them, wherein the high priests dwelt with a magnificence scarce less than that of the kings. On the ground were halls as vast and splendid as those of the palaces, where gathered throngs in worship of Zohalar and Tamash, and Loban, the chief gods of Sarnath, whose incense-enveloped shrines were as the thrones of monarchs. 
Not like the icons of other gods were those of Zokalar and Tamash and Loban, for so close to life were they that one might swear the graceful bearded gods themselves sate on the ivory thrones. And up unending steps of shining zircon was the tower chamber, wherefrom the high priests looked out over the city and the plains and the lake by day, and at the cryptic moon and significant stars and planets and their reflections in the lake by night. Here was done the very secret and ancient rite in detestation of Bakrug, the water lizard, and here rested the altar of chrysolite which bore the doom scrawl of Taranish. Wonderful, likewise, were the gardens made by Zokar, the olden king. In the center of Sarnath they lay, covering a great space and encircled by a high wall, and they were surmounted by a mighty dome of glass, through which shone the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was clear, and from which were hung fulgent images of the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was not clear. In summer the gardens were cooled with fresh odorous breezes skillfully wafted by fans, and in winter they were heated with concealed fires, so that in those gardens it was always spring. There ran little streams over bright pebbles dividing meads of green and gardens of many hues, and spanned by a multitude of bridges. Many were the waterfalls in their courses, and many were the lilied lakelets into which they expanded. Over the streams and lakelets rode white swans, whilst the music of rare birds chimed in with the melody of the waters. In ordered terraces rose the green banks, adorned here and there with bowers of vines and sweet blossoms, and seats and benches of marble and porphyry. And there were many small shrines and temples where one might rest or pray to small gods. Each year there was celebrated in Sarnath the Feast of the Destroying of Ib, at which time wine, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honors were then paid to the shades of those who had annihilated the old ancient beings, and the memory of those beings and of their elder gods was derided by dancers and lutenists, crowned with roses from the gardens of Zokar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath it. At first the high priests liked not these festivals, for there had descended amongst them queer tales of how the sea-green icon had vanished, and how Taran Ish had died from fear and left a warning. And they said that from their high tower they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed the very ancient and secret rite in detestation of Bokrug, the water lizard? And a thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarnath, wonder of the world and pride of all mankind. Gorgeous beyond thought was the feast of the thousandth year of the destroying of Ib. For a decade had it been talked of in the land of Menar, and as it drew nigh there came to Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants men of Thra, Ilarnek, and Kadatharon, and all the cities of Menar and the lands beyond. Before the marbled walls on the appointed night, were pitched the pavilions of princes and the tents of travelers, and all the shore resounded with the song of happy revelers. Within his banquet hall reclined Nargis High, the king, drunken with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Penath, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies at the feast, peacocks from the Isle of Nario, in the middle ocean, young goats from the distant hills of Implan, heels of camels from the Benazic desert, nuts and spices from Sidathrian groves, 
and pearls from wave-washed metal dissolved in the vinegar of thraw. Of sauces there were an untold number prepared by the subtlest of cooks in all Manar, and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all the viands were the great fishes from the lake, each of vast size and served up on golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace, and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters, others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temple, the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls, the princes of neighboring lands made merry. And it was the high priest, Ganai Ka, who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake and the damnable green mists that arose from the lake to meet the moon and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of fated Sarnath. Thereafter, those in the towers and without the walls beheld strange lights on the water and saw that the great rock, Akurion, which was wont to rear high above it near the shore, was almost submerged, and fear grew vaguely, yet swiftly, so that the princes of Alarnak and of Far Rokol took down and folded their tents and pavilions and departed for the river Eye, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, all the bronze gates of Sarnath burst open and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain, so that all the visiting princes and travelers fled away in fright, for on the faces of this throng was writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on their tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. Men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud of the sight within the king's banquet hall, where through the windows were seen no longer the forms of Nagas High and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green voiceless things with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips, and curious ears. Things which danced horribly, bearing in their paws golden platters set with rubies and diamonds containing uncouth flames. And the princes and travelers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, looked again upon the mist-begetting lake and saw the gray rock Akurion was quite submerged. Through all the land of Menar and the lands adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled from Sarnath, and caravans sought that accursed city and its precious metals no more. It was long ere any traveler went thither, and even then only the brave and adventurous young men of distant Felona dared make the journey. Adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes who are no kin to the men of Manar. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarnath, but though they found the vast lake itself and the grey rock Akurion which rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder of the world and pride of all mankind. Where once had risen walls of three hundred cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore, and where once had dwelled fifty millions of men, now crawled only the detestable green water lizard. Not even the mines of precious metal remained, for doom had come to Sarnath. But half buried in the rushes, was spied a curious green idol of stone, an exceedingly ancient idol coated with seaweed and chiseled in the likeness of Bokrug, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple at Alarnak, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land of Menar. A people move into a new land, annihilate the previous inhabitants, and eventually are caught unawares while basking in their own arrogance, decadence, and complacency, and are, in turn, annihilated themselves. Sounds like a rather repetitive theme in human history. I don't know. 
Perhaps I should have used this story in the Thanksgiving weekend episode instead. Ah, well, hindsight and all of that. Now, Lovecraft took inspiration from many aspects of his life. In some cases, other authors. In other cases, his own dreams. Such is the case with our next story, which was taken entirely from the recollection of one of Howard's own dreams. In fact, this next story also marks the first appearance of its titular character, who features prominently in a number of Lovecraft's future stories. So I present to you Howard Philip Lovecraft's The Statement of Randolph Carter. I repeat to you, gentlemen, that your inquisition is fruitless. Detain me here forever if you will. Confine or execute me if you must have a victim to propitiate the illusion you call justice. But I can say no more than I have said already. Everything that I can remember, I have told with perfect candor. Nothing has been distorted or concealed. And if anything remains vague, it is only because of the dark cloud which has come over my mind. That cloud and the nebulous nature of the horrors which brought it upon me. Again I say, I do not know what has become of Harley Warren. Though I think, almost hope, that he is in peaceful oblivion. If there be anywhere so blessed a thing. It is true that I have, for five years, been his closest friend, and a partial sharer of his terrible researches into the unknown. I will not deny, though my memory is uncertain and indistinct, that this witness of yours may have seen us together, as he says, on the Gainesville Pike, walking towards Big Cypress Swamp at half past eleven on that awful night. That we bore electric lanterns, spades, and a curious coil of wire with attached instruments, I will even affirm, for these things all played a part in the single hideous scene which remains burned into my shaken recollection. But of what followed, and of the reason I was found alone and dazed on the edge of the swamp the next morning, I must insist that I know nothing save what I have told you over and over again. You say to me that there is nothing in the swamp or near it which could Form the setting of that frightful episode, I reply that I know nothing beyond what I saw. Vision or nightmare it may have been. Vision or nightmare I fervently hope it was. Yet it is all that my mind retains of what took place in those shocking hours after we left the sight of men. And why Harley Warren did not return he or his shade, or some nameless thing that I cannot describe, alone can tell. As I have said before, the weird studies of Harley Warren were well known to me, and to some extent shared by me. Of his vast collection of strange, rare books on forbidden subjects, I have read all that are written in the language of which I am master. These are few as compared with those in languages I cannot understand. Most, I believe, are in Arabic. And the fiend-inspired book which brought on the end, the book which he carried in his pocket out of the world, was written in characters whose like I never saw elsewhere. Warren would never tell me just what was in that book. As to the nature of our studies... 
Must I say again that I no longer retain full comprehension? It seems to me rather merciful that I do not, for they were terrible studies, which I pursued more through reluctant fascination than through actual inclination. Warren always dominated me, and sometimes I feared him. I remember how I shuddered at his facial expression on the night before the awful happening when he talked so incessantly of his theory why certain corpses never decay but rest firm and fat in their tombs for a thousand years. But I do not fear him now, for I suspect that he has known horrors beyond my ken. Now I fear for him. Once more I say that I have no clear idea of our object on that night. Certainly, it had much to do with something in the book which Warren carried with him. That ancient book in undecipherable characters which had come to him from India a month before. But I swear I do not know what it was that we expected to find. Your witness says he saw us at half past eleven on the Gainesville Pike, heading for Big Cypress Swamp. This is probably true, but I have no distinct memory of it. The picture seared into my soul is of one scene only. And the hour must have been long after midnight, for a waning crescent moon was high in the vaporous heavens. The place was an ancient cemetery, so ancient that I trembled at the manifold signs of immemorial years. It was in a deep, damp hollow, overgrown with rank grass, moss, and curious creeping weeds, and filled with a vague stench which my idle fancy associated absurdly with rotting stone. On every hand were the signs of neglect and decrepitude, and I seemed haunted by the notion that Warren and I were the first living creatures to invade a lethal silence of centuries. Over the valley's rim, a wan, waning crescent moon peered through the noisome vapors that seemed to emanate from unheard-of catacombs, and by its feeble, wavering beams I could distinguish a repellent array of antique slabs, urns, cenotaphs, and mausoleum facades, all crumbling, moss-grown, and moisture-stained, and partially concealed by the gross luxuries of the unhealthy vegetation. My first vivid impression of my own presence in this terrible necropolis concerns the act of pausing with Warren before a certain half-obliterated sepulchre, and of throwing down some burdens which we seem to have been carrying. I now observed that I had with me an electric lantern, and two spades, whilst my companion was supplied with a similar lantern and a portable telephone outfit. No word was uttered, for the spot and the task seemed known to us, and without delay we seized our spades and commenced to clear away the grass, weeds, and drifted earth from the flat archaic mortuary. After uncovering the entire surface, which consisted of three immense granite slabs, we stepped back some distance to survey the charnel scene, and Warren appeared to make some mental calculations. Then he returned to the sepulchre, and using his spade as a lever, sought to pry up the slab lying nearest to a stony ruin which may have been a monument in its day. He did not succeed, and motioned to me to come to his assistance. Finally, our combined strength loosened the stone, which we raised and tipped to one side. 
The removal of the slab revealed a black aperture from which rushed an effluence of miasmal gases so nauseous that we started back in horror. After an interval, however, we approached the pit again and found the exhalations less unbearable. Our lanterns disclosed the top of a flight of stone steps, dripping with some detestable ichor of the inner earth, and bordered by moist walls encrusted with nitre. And now, for the first time, my memory records verbal discourse. Warren addressing me at length in his mellow tenor voice, a voice singularly unperturbed by our awesome surroundings. I'm sorry to have to ask you to stay on the surface, he said, but it would be a crime to let anyone with your frail nerves go down there. You can't imagine, even from what you have read and from what I have told you, the things I shall have to see and do. It's fiendish work, Carter. And I doubt if any man without ironclad sensibilities could ever see it through and come up alive and sane. I don't wish to offend you, and heaven knows I'd be glad enough to have you with me, but the responsibility is in a certain sense mine and I couldn't drag a bundle of nerves like you down to probable death or madness. I tell you, you can't imagine what the thing is really like. But I promise to keep you informed over the telephone of every move. You see, I've enough wire here to reach to the center of the earth and back. I can still hear. In memory, those coolly spoken words and I can still remember my remonstrances. I seemed desperately anxious to accompany my friend into those sepulchral depths, yet he proved inflexibly obdurate. At one time he threatened to abandon the expedition if I remained insistent, a threat which proved effective since he alone held the key to the thing. All this I can remember though I no longer know what manner of thing he sought. After he had secured my reluctant acquiescence in his design, Warren picked up the reel of wire and adjusted the instruments. At his nod, I took one of the latter and seated myself upon an aged disclosure of gravestone close by the newly uncovered aperture. Then he shook my hand shouldered the coil of wire, and disappeared within that indescribable ossuary. For a moment I kept sight of the glow of his lantern, and heard the rustle of the wire as he laid it down after him, but the glow soon disappeared abruptly, as if a turn in the stone staircase had been encountered, and the sound died away almost as quickly. I was alone, yet bound to the unknown depths by those magical strands whose insulated surface lay green beneath the struggling beams of that waning crescent moon. In the lone silence of that hoary and deserted city of the dead, my mind conceived the most ghastly fantasies and illusions and the grotesque shrines and monoliths seemed to assume a hideous personality, a half-sentience. Amorphous shadows seemed to lurk in the darker recesses of the weed-choked hollow, and to flit as in some blasphemous ceremonial procession past the portals of the moldering tombs in the hillside. Shadows which could not have been cast by that pallid, peering crescent moon. I constantly consulted my watch by the light of my electric lantern, and listened with feverish anxiety at the receiver of the telephone, but for more than a quarter of an hour heard nothing. Then, 
a faint clicking came from the instrument, and I called down to my friend in a tense voice. Apprehensive as I was, I was nevertheless unprepared for the words which came up from the that uncanny vault in accents more alarmed and quivering than any I had heard before from Harley Warren. He who had so calmly left me a little while previously now called from below in a shaky whisper more portentous than the loudest shriek. God, if you could see what I am seeing. I could not answer. Speechless, I could only wait. Then came the frenzied tones again. Carter, it's terrible, monstrous, unbelievable. This time, my voice did not fail me, and I poured into the transmitter a flood of excited questions. Terrified, I continued to repeat, Warren, what is it? What is it? Once more came the voice of my friend, still hoarse with fear, and now appearing tinged with despair. I can't tell you, Carter. It's too utterly beyond thought. I dare not tell you. No man could know it and live. Great God! I never dreamed of this. Stillness again. Save for my now incoherent torrent of shuddering inquiry. Then the voice of Warren in a pitch of wilder consternation. Carter, for the love of God, put back the slab and get out of this if you can. Quick! Leave everything else and make for the outside. It's your only chance. Do as I say and don't ask me to explain. I heard, yet was able only to repeat my frantic questions. Around me were the tombs and the darkness and the shadows. Below me, some peril beyond the radius of human imagination, but my friend was in greater danger than I, and through my fear I felt a vague resentment that he should deem me capable of deserting him under such circumstances. More clicking, and after a pause, a piteous cry from Warren. Beat it! For God's sake, put back the slab and beat it, Carter. Something in the boyish slaying of my evidently stricken companion unleashed my faculties. I formed and shouted a resolution. Warren, brace up. I'm coming down. But at this offer, the tone of my auditor changed to a scream of utter despair. Don't! You can't understand. It's too late. And my own fault. Put back the slab and run. There's nothing else you or anyone can do now. The tone changed again, this time acquiring a softer quality, as of hopeless resignation. Yet it remained tense through anxiety for me. Quick. Before... It's too late. I tried not to heed him. I tried to break through the paralysis which held me and to fulfill my vow to rush down to his aid. But his next whisper found me still held inert in the chains of stark horror. Carter, hurry! It's no use, you must go! Better one than two. Slap. A pause. More clicking. Then the faint voice of Warren. Only over now. Don't make it harder. Cover up those damned steps and run for your life. You're losing time. So long, Carter. I won't see you again. Here, Warren's whisper swelled into a cry. A cry that gradually rose to a shriek, fraught with all the horror of the ages. Curse these hellish things! 
Legions! My god! Beat it! Beat it! Beat it! After that, there was silence. I know not how many interminable aeons I sat stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into the telephone. Over and over again, through those aeons, I whispered and muttered, called, shouted, and screamed, Warren! Warren, answer me! Are you there? And then there came to me the crowning horror of all. The unbelievable, unthinkable, almost unmentionable thing. I have said that aeons seemed to elapse after Warren shrieked forth his last despairing warning, and that only my own cries now broke the hideous silence. But after a while, there was a further clicking in the receiver, and I strained my ears to listen. Again I called down, Warren, are you there? And in answer, heard, The thing which has brought this cloud over my mind. I do not try, gentlemen, to account for that thing, that voice, nor can I venture to describe it in detail, since the first words took away my consciousness and created a mental blank which reaches to the time of my awakening in the hospital. Shall I say that the voice was deep, hollow, gelatinous, remote, unearthly, inhuman, disembodied? What shall I say? It was the end of my experience and is the end of my story. I heard it and knew no more. Heard it as I sat petrified in that unknown cemetery in the hollow amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and the miasmal vapors. Heard it well up from the innermost depths of that damnable open sepulchre. As I watched amorphous, necrophagous shadows dance beneath an accursed waning moon, and this is what it said. You fool. Boy is dead. Spoiler alert, kitties. They don't execute Mr. Carter. In fact, he goes on to a number of other stories, as I, I previously mentioned, namely dealing with that fantastical realm known as the Dreamlands, which I fully intend on exploring in future episodes. Now, while I've always enjoyed Lovecraft's descriptions, it's also quite delightful when he leaves the unspeakable monsters, well, unspeakable when they are not described, but rather the reactions of those dealing with them sets the tone. Personally, I like to imagine that it's a, a pink animated plush bunny that is the source of the abject terror his poor characters are experiencing. It just tickles my whiskers. <laughs> Now, I believe that is all the time we have for today. There will be more Lovecraft in our next episode, so be sure to return. Until then, alas, my friends, the time has come. I do believe these stories are done. I am afraid that I must fly, but do come back. And please, don't die. <laughs> the Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission or Creative Commons license. 
or they're simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Competech.com, as well as Jason White, whose work can be found at SoundCloud.com slash angels of despair. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on Facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at SoundCloud.com slash Cheshire Hat. Or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. And as always, feel free to subscribe to our Patreon. And so with that... Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams.